What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ Bucky back with you. Buck, what is going on, man? Nah, man. Big weekend, big weekend coming up. I just love this part of the year because now uh, in college football, we begin to get some of the big games on the horizon. And then for the NFL, we're full swing. We're into the season. Yeah, we're going to uh, we're going to jump in on the NFL today. Tomorrow, we're going to have our buddy Bruce Feldman uh, is going to join us for the Friday pod. So today we're talking about some of these rookie impact scores. Uh, we do that each and every week individually, as well as the teams that are getting the most uh, uh, bang for their buck with their rookie classes. And then we're also going to uh, we're also going to look at the game of the week. Um, we have a good one with the Bengals and the Niners with some intriguing storylines uh, mixed in there as well. And uh, so we'll get to that here in just a moment. We're also going to do uh, we're going to I guess we're doing our Bucky's coaches corner on Thursday today. So we're going to jump a little a day early on that one. So uh, we'll get that going as well. Uh, but first of all, Buck, these uh, these rookie impact scores, um, interesting, interesting looking at this every week. Again, this is our buddy Jack Andre to put this formula together. It's a mix of playtime. It's a mix of performance, like on a weekly basis, and then we track it throughout the year. So which individual rookies are making the most impact? And then uh, on the back end of that, which teams are getting the most from their rookie class? So playing a lot of rookies and getting contributions. And if we look at the individual rookies, it shouldn't be a surprise based on the Monday night performance that Jordan Addison had the most impact of any rookie in the league this last week. No, not a surprise. And DJ, it's one of the things that we've talked about, and it continues to kind of validate a, a, a trend or a narrative that we've kind of talked about on the podcast about wide receivers and evaluating wide receivers and how you can't go wrong with the guys that are the skill route runners, the craftsmen, as we like to say, more so than the athletes, we are seeing that the guys that jump in and immediately have success are the ones who understand how to run routes, the ones who have a great feel for the timing of the passing game, and they get it done. And so they may not be the fastest, even though Jordan Addison and uh, some of these other guys are fast and fast enough. They are the ones that when you watch on tape, you see that they have a little nuance to their game. It's just something about those guys kind of having those tools available that allows them to jump right in and have immediate success. Garrett Wilson was another one who had it. I mean, the list goes on and on over the last four or five years where we've seen the guys that have jumped in are the guys are the most skilled at the position, not necessarily the most athletic at the position. One of our buddies, I won't, I won't mention his name, but a mutual friend of ours did some homework uh, on rookie wide receiver production and how that translates, you know, moving forward. And it turns out, you know, it's hard to ease into your NFL career now at a wide receiver. Either you kind of are or you aren't. Like the guys come in the league, they make an immediate impact, and off they go. Or they come into the league, they struggle, and they never really get it going. It's kind of weird. It's not really a developmental position anymore. No, I think a lot of these offensive positions, it's hard to develop. So let's be honest about when it comes to playing wide receiver. Um, in this era, the 7-on-7 seven -seven era, DJ, you've already run hundreds of thousands of routes by the time you've got to the National Football League. Uh, you've caught a million passes. You've done a lot of things. How much more can you develop a guy at the highest level when you've had access to all of these things in high school, college, training? Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's so it's hard. So whatever train, I mean, you've been trained. A lot of these guys have been training since they're seven years old. The margins, the margins aren't what they once were because before we didn't have training. When we were coming up, DJ, people weren't working on the ladder. They weren't doing all the things that we see the kiddos do. And so yeah. now I, I kind of in agreement with like your buddy. Hey, what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot that we can do at the NFL level to teach you how to run routes, to teach you how to catch a ball and those things. It's more polishing stuff up in the pros more so than, hey, I'm going to teach you how to play this position. It's not true. I mean, it's, it's just not the case. Doesn't does, so shouldn't there be blinking uh lights that should scare you to death when you try and talk yourself into a raw, fast, athletic receiver who he's not polished, he hasn't we, he hasn't learned the nuances. You know, we'll get him to the NFL and he has these tools, this speed. We're gonna teach him how to gear down, we're gonna teach him how to lean and nod and get in and out of breaks. Like, no, you're not, you're not, you're not teaching him that. That's not happening. It, it hasn't happened in the last few years, uh, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's not happening. So then it becomes about make sure you place them in the right role. So mm -hmm. when we evaluate those kinds of players, right, the raw player that has great vertical speed but is not one that can kind of sink his hips and drop his weight, okay, well, immediately we're already thinking wide receiver three, wide receiver four, vertical yeah. threat, those guys. So it's being able to say 
here's what he is. He's a vertical stretch guy. He can be someone that plays this role in this kind of passing game and whatever. And you have to grade it appropriately. So he might not be a fit for every room. So you can give him his just due for the athleticism he brings. But when it comes to picking him, you better have a clear role for how he's going to get on the field because you can't ask him to do something that he's never done before. Yeah, no doubt. And and that's why it gets us to the rest of this list here. We, we said Addison first. Jameer Gibbs, running back from Detroit, was second. Um, and then let's get to these these groups of wideouts. It was a huge wideout week um, mm-hmm. for guys making impact. So you have Josh Downs uh, from the Colts. Puka Nakua does on here every week. Jake Bobo makes an entrance uh, out of UCLA with, uh, with Seattle. Uh, his teammate, JSN, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. Rasheed Rice uh, with the Chiefs. And then the last one we'll get to in a minute here is, is Tyson Bajan, the quarterback. But uh, to me, like Downs, Nakua, Bobo, like those guys were not – they're not Blazers. They weren't guys that, you know, won the stopwatch. But all those guys, if you watch them, there's a nuance to their game. And I think maybe that's the – maybe that's the scouting word that we need to incorporate more with, with route running. We talk about t- uh, tacticians. We talk about technicians. We talk about craftsmen. I, I think that there's something to be said for that word nuance because when you watch Josh Downs play for your Tar Heels, there's nuance to him as a route runner. Bobo, same thing at UCLA, kind of as that jumbo, like kind of receiver, big tight end, however you wanted to, to justify him or classify him. And then Puka Nakua, like nuance is a word that just came to my mind when I was thinking about those guys. Yeah. So uh, here's, here's what's interesting about all the guys that you mentioned. DJ, another thing that maybe is under discussed when we're evaluating wide receivers, production. Like, yeah. Look at their collegiate production. Puka Nakua has significant production at BYU. Uh, so we can talk about not only like the craftsman part of it, but you see them catch balls. You see them run routes. It's not as big of a projection because you've seen them have the kind of production that you want to see from those guys. Josh Downs caught a million passes. The thing about Bobo, which is interesting to me, one and and DJ another thing that had come up like smart guys. So look, yeah, he went from Duke to UCLA. He graduated, did all that other stuff or whatever. But then when you go and you look, he had 817 yards. He had a bunch of catches at 53 catch, 57 catches that last year at UCLA. And so it goes to what we're talking about: nuance, production, high IQ. I thought it was telling. I said I thought I said it here where DK Metcalf talked about. Jake Bobo inspired him to try and become a better route runner because yep. everything that coaches, uh, he, he, he was clinic tape watching yeah. him. He said everything that the coaches wanted, he did it. He did it right. So here we have this undrafted free agent who's doing all of these little things right. I'm supposed to be the big time player. I'm not. And so I basically got in the rookie's hip pocket to learn how to do something. When I heard that, I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Because it's you know how it is. Players would talk up other players, but the depth with which that he talked, discussed him, there was a serious respect and admiration, very similar to the way the Rams talked about Puka Nakua. So mm-hmm. it's just there's something to it, Josh Downs being, but all of those guys that you you mentioned making the immediate impact, they all were very impactful for their collegiate teams. No doubt. Um, I, I want to get to Bajan here. I'm going to see him uh, mm-hmm. in person. Looking forward to it. I saw him at the Senior Bowl. Uh, going to get a chance to see him as they play the Chargers on Sunday night. Man, he, he had a great first performance last week. He looked great against the uh, the, the mm-hmm. Raiders. He was playing on time. He was accurate. He extended some plays with his athleticism. And mm-hmm. so it kind of led people to, to go, okay, who the heck is this guy? You know, kind of go back to, to his report. And I want to mm-hmm. kind of talk about that for a second and then see if we can learn anything from, you know, it looks one game. But why might a, a quarterback from a lower level have success? Um, so Tyson Bajant was at Shepard, Division Two, right, Buck? Yes. Yep. Uh, 6031, 213, um, ran a 479. So those are kind of the measurables, a little over 63. Uh, so my notes on him gun, catch, rock, throw, a lot of kind of catch, rock, throw from the gun. The ball's out quick. It's tough to evaluate. I mean, the Lock Haven game was the first game I watched. He's up 48 to nothing at halftime. I wrote down, this is like a day in the park for this guy. He just sits back there in a comfortable cockpit and just delivers strikes all over the field. Uh, they run some zone read. He's athletic. Guy's got a million passing records. Um, and I didn't have him. I had him as kind of a, a uh, uh, seventh round PFA type player who I thought would be on a practice squad. 
was the grade that I gave him. And now, you know, here he is. He's already starting a game in his rookie campaign. He looks comfortable. He looks confident. Uh, and he's productive. So the, the three things I wrote down is maybe lessons that I can learn is we're always trying to look mm-hmm. at this thing and figure it out. So, okay, if you're – what are the things that make a small school quarterback have success or have a chance? We say at least he's got a chance the way he's looked already in one game. Mm-hmm. I said – I wrote down three things. Number one, he's got to have an NFL skill set. So can he – does he have the traits that you look for, you know, size, mm-hmm. arm strength, athleticism, yep. you know, all that stuff? Check. Do they dominate that level? Well, he set every record. He completely dominated at that level. So he checked mm-hmm. that box. And then it comes down that I wrote down, is he is he properly wired? Like is the intelligence work ethic component all there? And by all accounts, everybody that went through there, he was nails there. So maybe that should have been a little foreshadowing that this guy has a chance because he checked those three boxes. Absolutely. So I would be curious um, to hear your thoughts on what did he look like at the senior bowl before I comment on some of my thoughts on him as Shepard? Yeah, up and down, up and down, you know, a little inconsistent. I think there was an adjustment period there for him. Uh, But, you know, he was he didn't look out of place at all from, you know, from a skill set standpoint. You know, he's he's somebody looked very, very much in line with what was there. Okay, so I think it's interesting. Right. So you talked about dominating at that level. So, DJ, just looking through his bio. Uh, number of 300 yard passing games. He had 32. <laughs> number number of 400 yard passing games. He had 10. Okay, yeah. so one of the things we talked about it as it, when we were trying to do the evaluation on Trey Lance, like the number of reps yeah. throwing the ball. Like when you did his college career, it was like less than a thousand like total reps in terms of just attempts. So when I tell you that someone has 32 300 yard games and 10 400 yard games. Like, that's a lot of balls that have gone in the air. He has seen a lot. Secondly, like, the thing about D2 and that stuff, like, yeah, you want to see him dominate at the level. But the thing that we're seeing when it comes to quarterbacks, the number of starts matters. Yes. So not only the reps that you get throwing, but the number of times you're under center in a game, seeing different coverage, regardless of the level, it makes sense. So everyone is chasing Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy had like 47 starts. DTR had a great preseason, struggling the one game that he started, but he's another guy that had 50 some starts. DJ, you know Bo Nix has 56 starts already at Oregon. <laughs> right. So, so, but but when you start to think about that, it look, it's no different than in life. With the experience brings a level of expertise. And the more experience you have, you get it. But one thing that I will say this, and I would challenge this to the Chicago Bears. I just want to know why. Okay, you start in Tyson Magnet. You feel the need to simplify the offense. You do some things that are easy. Mm-hmm. Hey, have you thought about maybe doing that with Justin Fields too? Like, yeah. I, I do wonder sometimes, like, the natural bias or – the bias, I call it the bias. The natural bias that you may have as a play caller. Okay, so when you have Justin Fields, who's a top pick, you feel like I got to give him more. He's mm-hmm. a franchise quarterback. Now you get tasked with having to play the backup. So what do you do? Cut it down. Let them play fast. Let's give them a chance. I bet you if you took the same game plan and cut it down and did the same thing for Justin Fields, remember his comments where he felt like I'm playing like a robot. I got a lot of information. I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I think most people benefit from that. So the lesson to be learned is Tyson Badgett on his own, good player, had all that other stuff. But the other thing the Bears should do, Maybe they should simplify everything for all of their players so they can play fast. Because it's the best of Bears that look on yeah. offense. The best that they look. And so I think you have to carry that forward, regardless of whether Badger's in, Fields in. That has to be their approach. Man, allow them to execute, allow them to play fast. Because if you play fast, most times you can be productive. Yeah, and I went through, uh, I went back because I'm remembering the week of practice, and I was like, oh, how did Bajant do in the game? In the game, he did have a pick, Buck. He was 17 of 22 for 138 yards. So, and that's the other thing is that you see guys when the lights are on, a little different. Like he had up and down, a little inconsistent during the week of practice. Bam, the game comes along, and it, it, numbers are good outside of the, you know, outside of the interception. He was very accurate, and that's what you saw in this game. He wasn't aggressively pushing the ball down the field. He was taking what they were giving him, just completing passes. You don't amass that many completions in that many big yardage games without just taking completions. That's what he did. He just took completions. He wasn't trying to do too much. And it, look, man, you score a lot of runs in baseball, hitting singles and doubles. You yep. know what I'm saying? You don't have to hit home runs. You just kind of move it uh, down the field. And he was able to do that. And when you do that at the NFL level, what it does is 
every completion affects the defense. I don't care what anyone says. I've, I've sat in rooms where the defense coordinator said that the quarterback will not take the check down. He will mm-hmm. not take the check down. We'll let him take the check down or whatever. DJ, they take four check downs in a row. Hey, we got to jump the check down. Yeah, and then yeah. the other stuff happens. And so when quarterbacks master that understanding of how to play the game, it really becomes very easy. Drew Brees was able to do it. Tom Brady did it for years. They will take the check down. Okay, I'll just keep. You get out of, you get out of alignment, then they hit you over the top. Yeah. His ability to be efficient and to chase completions allowed this offense to be effective because they they chewed up more first downs because they utilized all the options within the route concept, which is what good quarterbacks are able to do. I would encourage everybody to um, our uh, our colleague Chase Daniel, who has just jumped into the media, is you know long time quarterback. Oh yeah, NFL. he's got a video on YouTube when he goes through Bajan's game, and he'll show it's really he does a really nice job, and he'll show you him getting to three and four in the progression full field like he's you know the ball is not traveling far down the field but he's working fast he's getting through reads he's getting through pro- progression so i would encourage if you haven't um check that out chase doing a nice job there um all right buck the uh, the teams here real quick in terms of the impact from the rookies overall uh seahawks number one uh this week with 50 points the packers who have a lot of guys playing uh jaden reed you know had he didn't have much but he had a receiving touchdown musgrave uh, played 52 snaps, had 30 yards. They got the kicker, Carlson. Uh, they've got a corner in Carrington Valentine who played 62 snaps, had eight tackles. So Seahawks won. We talked about a bunch of those guys. The Packers, too. The Lions shouldn't be a surprise with Gibbs, Laporta, Jack Campbell, Brian Branch all playing uh, prominent roles for their team. The Cardinals were next. Um, uh, DeMarcado, the running back, had 75 total yards. Uh, Starling Thomas, the corner. Played mm-hmm. 66 snaps. Garrett Williams is out there healthy now, the corner. Uh, he had an interception. Michael Wilson, the wideout, playing 56 snaps. Not a ton of production, but he's out there playing. And Paris Johnson, you know, 69 snaps out there at tackle. So a lot of rookies playing for the Cardinals. And then finally, the Rams. We knew about their rookies all year long. Uh, Puka Nakua, 154 yards. Byron Young played 57 snaps, had a couple quarterback hits. Avila, the guard. Uh, he played 72 snaps. And then the defensive tackle, Kobe Turner, undersized DT, uh, he played 51 snaps, had three tackles. So it's interesting to see those teams playing a lot of rookies. And a lot of these guys, it's not like we're talking about you know monster productive games, but it gives you an idea of the teams that are relying on rookies, playing them a lot, getting them out there on the field, and relying on them to play you know, a bunch of meaningful snaps. And it may not pay off right now in the immediate future, but down the line, that experience matters. And – you know, DJ, it's one of the things that we can appreciate from a personnel standpoint when coaches play young guys. Yeah. Look, it has to be a mutual decision with the personnel department and the coaching staff. When we take players, we're going to be committed to playing our young guys. And sometimes you have to take a step back. You may not win immediately, but that experience is going to pay off handsomely. It also brings a different level of energy to the field. So when I look at the guys that you're talking about, you talk about the Seahawks, the Packers, the Cardinals. The Cardinals are playing competitive games, not winning, but playing competitive. That new energy, man, if you can harness that going into the down the stretch run, you can win some more games. But then going into next year, that's when you'll see the dividends of playing the young guys. That experience in year one is going to help those guys play faster and hopefully play better in year two. No doubt. Um, All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to get to Bucky's Coach's Corner. Uh, We're talking about determination this week. Uh, Bucky's going to have a little – a little knowledge for us, a little wisdom for us. And we're also going to talk about the game of the week, in our opinion, which is the Cincinnati Bengals coming off their bye. They are on the road to take on the 49ers. So uh, we'll get to those two cop, two topics right after this. It's time for the MTS game of the week presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. This week, the Bengals are at the 49ers. The spread is minus three and a half, favoring the Niners. The over under is 43 and a half. DJ, this is a great game. I mean, this is like, one of those old school Super Bowl matchups from back in the 80s. Like, I can't wait to see how this plays out. Uh, What are your initial thoughts? Joe Burrow and company taking on the Niners. Well, I think let's start as we're recording this. We don't know who's playing quarterback for San Francisco. So I I thought it'd be interesting um, if you look at Brock Purdy. I was talking about this the other day. Um, I don't think it was on our show. It was uh, somewhere else. But we were talking about, you know, is the book out on Brock Purdy? They've lost a couple games, you know, late in the game this last week. He has the interception, has two picks overall in that game against the Minnesota Vikings like you know what's the deal and we talked a little bit about this earlier in the week but my takeaway was a Kyle Shanahan offense the whole thing is predicated on playing even or with a lead 
because mm -hmm. everything is about the run action and the pass action looking exactly the same. And that's what you can do when when the game is in your favor or whether it's even. When you are trailing, when you get down early in the game and you're trailing, defenses don't give a crud about your run action. They're not going to honor that. So you're not going to be able to scheme guys and get them wide open. You're going to have more tight window throws. You're going to have guys that need to win one-on-one. -on -one. And while I would give Purdy, with his skill set, what we've seen thus far, the edge over Sam Darnold in terms of operating in that environment, and seeing things clearly and, and taking those gimmies and getting them out there on time and getting through progressions and, and Shanahan's going to have a, somebody there for you. I think Sam Darnold's better equipped just with arm mm -hmm. strength and athleticism and all those different traits that he has that made him a top five pick versus Mr. Irrelevant. I think in if they were to find themselves down in a game, I think that Sam Darnold is more equipped to help them get back into the game, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Makes a lot of sense. Had a chance to go see the Niners this summer during training camp. And all the buzz was about Sam Darnold being the most talented quarterback in the building. That was when Trey Lance was there and Sam Darnold was slinging it all over the yard. Brock Purdy was the guy that it dealt. He was unbeaten as a starter. So Cal Shanahan naturally felt like he was going to be the guy. There's a part of me, though, that thinks if Sam Darnold has an opportunity to play, that Cal Shanahan is excited about what Sam Darnold can bring to the team. He expands the, uh, the field a little bit in terms of his arm talent may allow him to take more shots down the field and do some more of the things that are also a part of his, uh, his, his game plan, his package. So I don't think anything really changes for the Niners. If anything, they may have more of a deep ball element to their game plan than we've seen in the past. And in terms of like the Brock Purdy thing, they're going to be some of these moments, right? So we remove Christian McCaffrey from the lineup one week, Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, Trent Williams. It's going to be hard for any quarterback to function without three of your main cogs. in it. Mm -hmm. like, that's a part of it. So, he will continue to be what Cal Shanahan wants, which is a pass first point guard at the position for Sam Donald. it will be interesting. The one thing I will say about this matchup against the Bengals, Lou and Arumo and the Bengals defense are beginning to kind of find their way. Had a lot of change. Coming off in a bye too, Buck. Coming off a bye. Had a lot of turnover in the back end. They're going to face the best version of the Bengals defense that they've seen to date. Could be difficult. It may not be on their own. It may just be because the Cincinnati Bengals are playing better and it's finally beginning to click with a bunch of young guys playing in the secondary. And yeah, getting Joe Burrow that rest with the bye with that calf, he was starting to really, you know, starting to get things going, starting to look more like himself. Now he's had some rest. I'm curious to see if we see the best of Joe Burrow. If, if we do, uh, we're in for a heck of a game. I, I can't wait to see it and see how that all shakes out. I, I do think, you know, this 49ers defense is, is very good. They're very talented. But as you saw, Kirk Cousins light them up a little bit through the air. Um, Joe Burrow could get loose a little bit with his weapons, too, in this game. Yeah, hard game for the Niners. We'll see if they can come out on top. But, look, it should be a shoot. I expect to be a one-score game going down the stretch and team with the ball at the end is probably going to be the team that wins. Last thing on this one, going back to Sam Darnold, uh, if he plays well in this game and then, say, Brock Purdy comes back in and they go on their run and do whatever they do, this this could be a career – I want to say career saving, but a career altering game for Sam Donald. Think about this. Number one, you'd see him play really well, which will get teams excited. But then you get to see him in an offense that darn near half the league is running right now in Shanahan's yeah. offense. His assistants are everywhere, scattered all over the league. So not only are you going to get an endorsement uh, from Kyle, but you're also going to have an example, a proof of concept, so to speak, of him functioning in an offense that so many other teams run. Yeah, he's going to have an opportunity, and there are going to be plenty of spaces available. And so this is, uh, I won't say like a, a big game for Sam Bono, but it's a big game. He needs to play well. No so doubt. that was the MTS Game of the Week presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers can bet just $5 and get 200 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code MTS. That's code MTS only at DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. All right, Buck. We are uh, we're to the uh, the bottom of the show here, and uh, I'm 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 curious. We normally do a coach's corner on Fridays. We switch it to Thursdays this week because we got Feldman, our buddy Bruce Feldman, coming on the show tomorrow. Uh, but what is the word for today? Give us a little wisdom here. What we got? Okay, so the word for the day is determination. And when you look okay. up the word in the dictionary, one of the words that comes along with that is resoluteness. And so that is just a firm belief and an unwavering belief that you're going to be able to get the job or task done. When you think about football, really, uh, we talk about imposing your will on the opponent. Are you stubborn enough to continue to do what you do 
in spite of whatever the opposition is doing? And how long can you stick with that? We have seen these teams that start out one way, then the middle of the game, they shift. They don't believe necessarily in who they are and what they're about. We've had discussions on podcasts where we talked about, hey, this team presents itself as a tough and physical team, but as soon as it gets tough, they tuck their tail in and run. So the biggest thing that you're trying to impress upon your team, whether it's your team at work, your team on the sports field is, can you believe in what we're doing and can you believe in it when everything is going awry? Because the teams that make it to the other side continue to believe when there's really no evidence for them to believe that what they're doing is going to pay off. And so as the coaches and pressing upon them that if we continue to do the things the right way, if we continue to follow the process, eventually we'll be rewarded for our efforts. But the only way you can do that is you have to be determined to get to the other side. You kind of almost have to have, and we've talked about this, this competitive arrogance that Mm -hmm. what you're doing is better than what the opponent is going to do. And at the end of the day, uh, it's going to work out in your favor because you're more determined to do it your way than the opposition is going to do it their way. Yeah, I I think determination, I think of the word unwavering is one that that comes to mind. Like you don't drift off course uh, when you're determined. And I always like to try and when when you give us these uh, nuggets, I always try and think of like some alliteration or a way to kind of make this succinct in three points. So I wrote down, uh, when you think about determination, think about non-negotiables. Like we're not going to negotiate with these things. Like this is who we are. This is not something that we're going to drift. It is non-negotiable. There are no shortcuts would be the second one. There's no, there's no way to get to that destination other than the way that is required. You cannot try and get there and take a shortcut and, and, and try and sneak around something. That That's not being determined. That's looking for an easy way out. Um, so you've got non-negotiables. You've got no shortcuts. And I just wrote down, you never quit. No matter what it looks like, you don't quit. And that's that's something to me that shows determination. Determination doesn't always land you in the winner's circle. Um, but determination is 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 an example of you never quitting and never stopping in your pursuit of getting to the winner circle. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but no matter what, you still have faith that you can eventually get to the other side. It may be this year, maybe next year, maybe in five years, but whatever it is, you still come to work every day with that focus in mind. We're going to get to the championship level. Uh, it may take us a while to get there, but we're going to get there. We just have to make sure we continue to show up every day and eventually we'll show out and get it done. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of a team. Uh, I'm thinking of the Detroit Lions. I know they're coming off of a big loss last week against the Ravens. But if you think about a determined leader and a determined team, I would say the Detroit Lions are a great case in that. They they have they have absolutely not negotiated. Uh, they have been uh, a belief in a system and a path and a work ethic and a style of play. They've committed to that. There's no shortcuts. They weren't trying there. It's saying we're going to go here and go to the, a- the NFC Championship game year one. Uh, they're plotting forward and they're taking those positive steps. And there's no, there's been no quit in them, even in games that they've lost. If you look at last year, um, this is a team that'll fight you all the way down to the end. Yeah, it fights you all the way down to the end is one of the things that I can't wait to see their bounce back game because determined teams, they may have a setback, they may have a hiccup, but they get right back on the course and they continue to plot along like they've been plotting to this point. Oh, there you go. There's this week's edition of uh, of Bucky's Coach's Corner. Hope you guys enjoy that as much as I do each and every week. Uh, I want to remind you one more episode this week. We have five episodes a week, including the Move the Sticks video show. That streams at 4 p.m. Pacific uh, every Tuesday on the NFL Fast channel. So we do appreciate you guys hanging with us. We do appreciate the uh, the ratings, reviews, and uh, and hitting that subscribe button. We appreciate all of it. So, uh, again, we will see you tomorrow. One more episode before we get to the weekend here. Uh, right here on Move the Sticks.